Hey, pals, we just want to say thank you to all our fans that support us out there. If you want to become a supporter and you like to support us through the value for value proposition, we provide value and we would love to see you give us some value back. You can see all the ways that you can do that at Patreon. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash go with the heat. Now let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Believe it or not, this is the last episode of the Crockett Amnesia story arc. I'm sad. I'm going to miss the ponytail. <laughs> Just a little bit. I, I really enjoyed it. He got stuff done. He was effective. <laughs> <laughs> Efficient, really, like. He didn't kill that many people, but still struck fear into the hearts of everyone. I like how he didn't kill that many mm-hmm. people. He did murder a lot. <laughs> many people. <laughs> well, this we is don't have an exact count. It's probably <laughs> somewhere in the 30s. Not that many people. <laughs> well, this is season five, episode two, titled Redemption in Blood. It originally premiered on November 11th, 1988. It is written by Robert Ward. He's got seven more episodes coming that he's going to write in season five. He's all up in season five. <laughs> yes. He is also the co-executive producer with Michael Mann of the show. So question. Where has he been all this where time? Where has Robert Ward been? <laughs> <laughs> he's going to write eight episodes in season five total. And he's co-executive producer. Was it just like now that Dick Wolf is gone? It's like, cool. Now no one's paying attention. I can get my stuff in. I don't know. It's not saying a lot for Dick Wolf. Uh, I think it's... <laughs> I think it's now that Dick's gone, Michael Mann can hire all of his buddies back. (laughs) Yeah, because this guy did write for Crime Story. Oh, well, there you go. (laughs) It is directed by Paul Krasny, who also has one more episode coming. And for both of these men, just like last week, it was their first thing they've ever done with Vice as far as writing or directing. So like I said, essentially no one from the previous season is going to come back. We're going to be saying a whole bunch that this was their first and they have this many more to go in season five. They really went deep on the bench on this one. Like they came out, the the manager came out tapping his right arm and like, there ain't no more righties out here. I was like, all right, so how many lefties you got? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was going to say, like, is that necessarily a bad thing that no one's coming back? (laughs) I mean, from season four, it's true. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) Maybe they just do what they had to do. (laughs) All right, John. This week's music is, I guess, not surprising. And then also to um, to learn that one of the songs in this will get used repeatedly in season five. So I don't know how to feel about that right now. This is a good introduction to season five's music because things have kind of changed. And one of the things, let's talk about the familiar name in the music. We have Don't Give Up by Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush. Obviously, we've talked about Peter Gabriel. This is Peter Gabriel's seventh song in the series. (laughs) The most songs by any solo artist in the entire series. By the way... It is also one of five of the song of his seven songs in the series off the album So. Oh, so wow. someone really liked the album So. So clearly someone on staff really liked the album So more than anything. By the way, Kate Bush also uh, appeared in our music way back in the Hello uh, with Hello Earth in the episode Bushido. Mm. Since we have talked about both the artists, we will kind of skip going over their biographies for you. And instead, we will say adieu to Peter Gabriel because this will be his final appearance. The last time I plan on talking about Peter Gabriel. So, (laughs) um, and his albums. Our next song is You'll Never Listen to Me by Peter Cetera. Peter Cetera, most notable for being the lead singer and bassist of the band Chicago. Maybe my least favorite thing that has the word Chicago in it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, he was an original member of the band from 1967 to 1985. From 85 until, well, now, uh, he's had a pretty successful solo career as, as as well. Believe it or not, guys, he was a part between 67 and 85 of 17 Chicago albums. 
Holy crap. Those guys have way too much time yes. on their hands. And then after 17 albums with Chicago, he released eight solo records as well. So uh, he's been busy. Wow. He was born and raised in Southside Chicago. So I guess the name of the band kind of fits there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he actually went to your seminary school in high school because his mom wanted him to be a priest. But that didn't actually work out. He got into music. His parents, instead of buying him a guitar, bought him an accordion, which I got a good <laughs> chuckle at. Hold on. Hold on. I just thought of the best thing ever as a parent. If you really want to troll your child. <laughs> Get an accordion, yeah. You buy him an accordion. I heard you like this. Yeah. Hey, Mom, oh. Dad, I'm going to... Can, can you guys give me a guitar? Sure. Here's an accordion. <laughs> also... It's probably the evilest gift to give to a to someone who has kids. Like I bought your kid an accordion. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at you, John. Yes. Don't buy any accordions. <laughs> you get a kid an accordion. <laughs> at the age of fifteen, a trip to a club with some friends would inspire him to go out and buy his own acoustic guitar at the good old Montgomery Wards. <laughs> He'd eventually be led to playing bass, and by the end of high school, he would play for a rather popular regional band called The Exceptions. He even <laughs> joked that at the time he was making more money than his dad playing music. Sub now accordion. <laughs> The Exceptions would release several singles and ultimately one five-song EP entitled Rock and Roll Mass. But in December 1967, he would show up early to one of his shows so that he could watch a band called The Big Thing perform. Enjoy it. In fact, he would be inspired by their use of the horn section in combination with their rock and roll sound. And he would leave The uh, Exceptions and join the big thing. Wow, you can just do that? Be like, I'm joining you guys. <laughs> Came to see one yeah. of your shows, now I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only would he join, but he would help them ch change their name. I, I emphasize help them change <laughs> their name to Chicago Transit Authority. <laughs> That's it. Which would I'm later be shortened to Chicago. I'm starting a band named Bart. <laughs> <laughs> so if you thought they were named after the city of Chicago, you're wrong. They're actually named after the Transportation Authority. Satara actually started out with the band sharing vocals with Robert Lamb and Terry Kath. But by the second album, he'd make his presence known with the song 25 or 6 to 4, which would be their first major hit with Satara on vocals. He would enter the 70s. He would become a more prolific songwriter, leading to the height of their popularity in 1976 when he would write and sing If You Leave Me Now. It, it would be their first number one single, and that would appear on the 10th album. <clears throat> By 1981, the popularity of disco would cause Chicago's popularity to drop, and Satara would try his first solo album, called Peter Cetera, and it would be kind of, a, well, a commercial failure. So he would run back to Chicago. In 82, Chicago would release Chicago 16, because after, you know, 16 albums, you just start to number them rather than name them. <laughs> Their song, Hard to Say I'm Sorry, would go number one and help boost them back into popularity. It would also be featured in the movie Summer Lovers, starring Daryl Hannah. And it would hang around with Chicago until 84, when they would release Chicago's Chicago 17 album. See? It started number. <laughs> it makes sense now. With the popularity of Chicago 17, which had multiple hits on it, he would once again try and go solo. And this time in 85, he would leave the band and actually be successful going solo. And most successful solo songs is Glory of Love, which is the theme to Karate Kid 2. The best Karate Kid. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, he, was, he would see continued success through the 80s and 90s as a solo artist, even wrote, even co-wrote the Baywatch theme. And he still performs and records today. He even has his own label, and he lives in Idaho for some strange reason. <laughs> Stuff I know. <laughs> you heard it. You heard us. <laughs> yeah. Come on. So, and that leads us to our final song, Everything Inside of Me by Tim Truman. So we talked about it a little bit of season four, 
But season four was the last season for Jan Hammer. Jan Hammer would leave the show. And so Tim Truman actually would take over for Jan Hammer in season five. Tim Truman would get the job after composing uh, the score for Michael Mann's TV movie, L.A. Takedown, which is what the inspiration for the movie Heat was. If working with Michael Mann wasn't enough, he would also be recommended by his good friend Don Johnson. (laughs) <laughs> oh, there we go. So I mentioned, you know, maybe Michael Mann hiring his buddies back. Just bringing them all on. Come on, guys. It's, it's season five. <laughs> this is all we're doing. <laughs> so, yeah, he would take over uh, composing for the show. And actually, in this episode, he had originally chosen a John Cougar Mellencamp song. You know, Cougar, the Cat, <laughs> El Gato, Morris the Panther. <laughs> guys starting to see see this guy's witty he thinks about this stuff <laughs> but unfortunately the show could not secure the rights to it in time and so he would quickly record everything inside of me including singing the lyrics not only did he write it but he also performed and recorded it and it got such good reception that the show turned around and asked him to write two more more songs later on this in season five. So we will talk about Tim Truman again. Now, I have no I read, idea what I will say. <laughs> I read something very interesting about the use of Tim Truman that it was a sign of their music budget because he was doing kind of mock songs. They were like covers of other people's songs, but with the lyrics slightly changed or the tune slightly changed so that they couldn't pay for the correct song. So they had Tim Truman make a similar version it's like the dollar tree knockoff version of (laughs) the song that they wanted it's a generic (laughs) so basically jan hammer had his own style and when tim truman came in he didn't want to just start redoing he didn't want to follow up jan hammer doing trying to impersonate him and the showrunners did use it kind of to their leverage tim truman was composing mostly a rap a rock and roll soundtrack for the show and a lot of people attributed it as a way for them to use to spend less money on popular music but still have the rock and roll background uh in between shots and scenes so whereas you know you had the crockett theme and the tubs theme and stuff from jan hammer what we got from tim truman aside from writing three songs on the of his own in the music was that he also did uh, like he would compose like rock songs for scenes that sounded like popular music at the time. Pretty sneaky, sis. Pretty <laughs> sneaky. He would, after Vice, he would still do some. Uh, he would do. I would say this when he left Vice, he he's known for a couple big things that he did composing wise. But in between those big things. He did a crap ton of scores for TV movies. TV movies like Knight Rider 2010. (laughs) And Martial Law starring Jimmy Smits. I know that name. (gasps) I want to watch that now. I don't know what that is, but I want to see it. (laughs) Hey, how come Jimmy Smits had to die in an explosion? How come he couldn't just get amnesia? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe he's not Uh, dead. (laughs) (laughs) He's just... He's just got amnesia, and he's, for some reason, doing martial law. He's solving crimes in New York City with another partner that'll turn his back on him, and then he'll die of cancer. Hey, stop it. <laughs> he doesn't die of cancer, he dies of a heart condition. An actual movie movie that he would do the score for was Oliver Stone's South Central, but... Getting back to the TV show side, he would also compose the main title theme for Melrose Place and score over 120 episodes. You're welcome. <laughs> well, John, I was I saw the people who were on the list for the music and I was like, Tim Truman, that's who I'm ready for. Tim, I, Peter Zotera, whatever. Peter Gabriel, get off me, bitch. <laughs> Tim Truman, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And Melrose Place is not the only place that he would continue to see success. He would score 35 episodes of the Showtime series Jeremiah. He would also win win an Emmy as a co-producer for something called The Killer Whale People. (laughs) And he also scored the entire first season of the show Charmed. Well, that's okay. Maybe they weren't all successful. (laughs) 
Currently, he is directing a project. He wrote himself a sci-fi film called Time Call, which the last we checked, is preparing to start filming to 2018. So keep your eyes peeled for Time Call. Netflix will pretty much commission anything, which is why we're missing an opportunity not to submit a script. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Time Call will have Jimmy Smith. I don't know. <laughs> a movie called Time Call? That's got JCVD all over it. Okay, that's even better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can we get Jimmy and JCVD in one movie together? I don't know. I can't handle that. Term. <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Not just this episode, but the amnesia arc in general. Because we reached the end. We have badass Burnett. He's back to being middle of the road Crockett. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Where you stand on my opinion on one more episode. If they had one more episode for the Amnesia arc, would that have made the ending to the Amnesia storyline better? Also, I want to hear from you. If you think we're way off base on this, that this is how it should have ended. Now, we're just keep in mind... John and I have not seen the rest of season five, so we don't know what's going to come. That's why we cleared the deck for Melissa to let her get some stuff off her chest because <laughs> she does know what happens in the rest of season five. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can see all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support us, support step number one. Email us, support step number two. Go to your podcast or platform of choice and give us five stars. iTunes in particular, if you'd want to go to that one, that'd be fantastic and give us five stars. Do not leave a review. Instead of leaving a review, please let us know. Would you be interested in buying a Morris the Panther t-shirt? If so, <laughs> how much would you pay for a Morris the Panther t-shirt? Just him when they open that door coming out at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. <laughs>